Hey everybody, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Haggerty. Today, I am joined by the founder of The Pocket PhD, Emily Crookston. How are you today, Emily? I'm great. How are you, Stephen? I'm fantastic. You're based out the other side of the world, basically, in yes. Carolina, South North Carolina? That's right, North Carolina. Yep. North Carolina. Yeah. Nice and early for you. Nice and late for me. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting into this topic because I think what you do is so interesting and uh, the industry as a whole is one that's probably taken quite a few different twists and turns in the last couple of years. So before further ado, can you just fill in people of what the Pocket PhD offers? Sure. So I'm a ghostwriter. Um, I love to work with clients who have big ideas and not very much time to write those big ideas down. Uh, so I, I work with professionals pretty much in any industry you can think of. I've written books um, on weight loss. I've written books on how to manage your money. Um, I'm about to start writing a book about um, physical therapy. Uh, so it's across the board, all different areas. Um, and I, I just really love getting into the sausage with my clients and sort of figuring out what's what's the best idea, how's the best way to translate this expertise for an audience. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really what I look for. Um, yeah, like I said, work with business owners, usually doing personal development, business development type work. Yeah. One of the things I've always wanted to ask a ghostwriter, especially ghostwriters that write books, is do you ever get emotionally attached to your work? And then when you see it in, you know, with someone else's name on it, is there any, is there ever any a bit where you're just like, oh, that should really be my name? Yeah, you know, I don't have, I haven't had that experience. I think I came into this business with kind of the right mindset. I started out writing blogs for people. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just kind of a natural progression to to writing books. And I, I feel like sometimes when when, you know, the best case scenario, it's a really collaborative process. And in the end, like my favorite interactions are when I open up the book and I point to a paragraph and I read it and I'm not sure if I wrote it or the author wrote it. Amazing. So I really like that. And, you know, I have had the experience where I'm like, oh, that was a great idea. I wish I'd had that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd written that for my blog instead of, you know, yeah. a client's blog or a client's book. Um, but, you know, I just love the the process. And when it works well, I don't feel at all like, oh, that was mine and I gave it to someone else. Um, yeah. so, so with the collaboration that I, I try to cultivate, it can work really well. What, what, how, do, how are ghostwriters looked upon in the industry? Is it an asset? Are you something where, you know, someone comes in and for some, because they can't write what they think they can write? Where do, you, where do ghostwriters stand in that side? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I have had encountered people early on, maybe a couple of years ago, where I said I'm a ghostwriter and they said, oh, well, you know, I've been taken advantage of by ghostwriters or something like that. Um, and, and I think it was a person in the coaching industry. And I guess so maybe in that industry, there could be a little bit of questioning about mm -hmm. what your motives are like why I think a lot of the the surrounding question is like what you just asked me why would you give away your best ideas <laughs> yeah. um, but I think of them as the author's ideas so in that sense it, it doesn't I don't experience that but um yeah I think ghostwriter I think in in general what I do seems to be highly valued a lot of folks don't uh haven't heard of ghostwriting before they encounter really? me and they want to know what it wow. is and how it works um but when they find out about it they're often really excited because yeah. they've been struggling to write their books for years exactly. sometimes you come along and they, they just think wait a minute i can get this book written in a better <laughs> way that i could ever write it myself <laughs> yeah and have someone to bounce ideas off it's like right exactly we do this? yeah when you hear about the process um it's it becomes like a no-brainer in a lot of cases yeah. yeah so let's rewind then let's let's go back to how you got into and how you formed the pocket phd which by the way i love that name thank you <laughs> yeah so i used to be a professor so i do have a phd uh, i used to teach philosophy 
And wow. uh, yeah, so I, you know, I enjoyed teaching a lot. I miss teaching. Um, and I, I taught undergrads mostly intro to philosophy kinds of <laughs> kinds of classes, um, which I, I really enjoyed introducing people to the subject because when I was an undergrad, I didn't know what philosophy was and I had to take the intro class and fell in love. Um, so I, yeah, I was a professor and decided to leave academia for a lot of reasons, politics, um, you know, uh, job security wasn't yeah. what I thought it would be. Uh, and so I was like, what am I going to do? I liked marketing when I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of a friend was looking for marketing help and really what she needed was content marketing for me writing her blogs. Um, and she had a web development company. So she also had clients who needed mm -hmm. blog posts. Um, so I started there and at some point she said to me, you know, you could start a business. And I thought, oh, that would solve a lot of <laughs> a lot of my concerns about trying to find a corporate job and nine to five and all of that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did it. And it's funny because I don't know why starting a business didn't occur to me, except that my dad was an entrepreneur and uh, I sort of saw both sides of owning a business, you know, the mm -hmm. positives and the negatives. So I think that's why I was hesitant. Um, but I really love it. And I've been doing it for about four years now. Amazing. Um, yeah. And once I found the ghostwriting, it was so much better, so much easier for me because I don't think of my, I'm not good at copywriting. Like people sometimes yeah. say I'm a copywriter and I'm like, ah, that makes so, me crazy. So that was actually going to be one of my questions <laughs> is, yeah. one, what is the difference between a copywriter and a ghostwriter? Mm -hmm. And you obviously used, to, you know, when you were doing it before and you were writing blogs and articles for people, what made you focus on sort of predominantly doing the books? Yeah, so I I think the big distinction is copy is directed entirely at marketing, I would say. And like I said, I called myself a content marketer when I was mm -hmm. writing blogs, um, trying to trying to avoid like the snappy headlines and uh, the clever comebacks and the, the lines that really stick with you. I'm not that good at the short and sweet one liner. Yeah. Um, and the headlines are the hardest part for me of writing a blog <laughs> is coming up with the title. Um, <laughs> But I'm really comfortable writing about 1,200 words, you know, a nice little few pages. When you get into flow, you're in the yeah, zone. Yeah, and I, you know, it works because I think of it as more educational. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when I realized that I could write books for people, it was just a natural fit. I love the research aspect of writing a book. I love to learn about a new subject matter and um, figure out, you know, how to, how to best articulate it. Uh, yeah. So that part is really fun for me. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a, uh, God bless copywriters because they are amazing at what they do. I mean, I was talking to a branding specialist the other day and we were just both saying, it's so hard to brand yourself. <laughs> it's so hard to write marketing copy for your own business. Um, oh, and so always. It's amazing to have those folks who can, you know, just put it so beautifully. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> you that business owners uh we're all pretty much every business owner i know struggles with the thing that they sell themselves yeah. um and that you know we, we often just can't get out of our own way right, right? yeah on, on that note then for you what's been one of the biggest struggles that you've sort of come up against when you've grown pocket phd over the last four years so i always struggle with figuring out how to balance my time between working on the business and working in the business Classic. when yeah i know <laughs> uh when i'm busy with client work the marketing and the social media and the anything i do for brand awareness just tends to go out the window um and so during the pandemic time i've really enjoyed building my brand visibility getting on podcasts like yours um really working my linkedin stuff uh, being consistent in social media, like getting all mm -hmm. of these things working really well. But now I'm starting to get busier and I'm really trying to figure out how I can bring all of that with me, um, yeah. you know, into the next phase of the business. So I'd say that's one huge challenge for me. Um, I think the other thing is I, I, I wonder about whether I should hire a team. I wonder about, you know, should I stay you know, the head of my business, solopreneur, all by mm -hmm. myself. Um, it's really nice to have other people to bounce ideas off of. Um, I'm in a mastermind, which is really helpful. Um, but I wonder about 
you know, can I bring people on board to help me yeah. do some of the things? That... What would the business look like if you did sort of thing? Right. Yes. Yeah. Should I hire other writers? Should I, you know, get subcontractors who I can hire out to do some of the smaller projects? Um, so far, I haven't had the kind of volume that I felt pressure to, mm -hmm. you know, outsource things like that. Um, but it, it's a thought down the road. I don't know. I don't see myself as a boss. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy <laughs> where I'm, I'm responsible often, to me it? and me only. <laughs> it's <laughs> you know? right, a really good point you bring up, really, because I think there's a lot of external pressure on founders, business owners, entrepreneurs to go down that route of, hey, you've got to build a team. You've got to outsource as soon as possible. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Mm -hmm. When actually... You know, if you've managed to set things up in a way anyway that, you know, gives you time, gives you energy, doesn't mean you're working 26 hours a day, then the desire to build that team really often isn't there. Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, it's true. There's a cap on the number of hours I could work. And yeah, that means there's a cap on my income. And if I want to grow beyond that number, then mm -hmm. you know the next step is hiring a team and and you know white labeling or you know give, yeah. charging myself on top of giving myself a cut on top of but, what it, but if you're but... if that number gives you the lifestyle that you you currently right. want or whatever exactly. stage you're at at the moment then again there's no real pressure to change that yeah. um for you you know writing for me i always have to make sure my environment is perfect i'm not someone that can just rock online and just start writing mm -hmm. i wish i was because mm -hmm. it would mean i'd put out a lot more content but often my my other half will tell you that she will find me at 11 o'clock at night in my office because i've suddenly got the urge to write a load yeah. of content yeah for you how do you set yourself up to make sure that like you said you know you, you're perfectly happy sitting down writing twelve thousand words how do you how do you set yourself up to do that what's your prep yeah, that's a good question. So I do have moments where, um, you know, I the writing isn't coming on whatever the thing is I have in mind that I'm trying to get done. Um, oh, I need to write this blog post today. Uh, and then the ideas aren't coming. My The best thing I can do when that happens is walk away, go work on something else. Probably I'm just not in a writing mode in the mm -hmm. moment, just like you're describing. It's not usually that the content itself is tripping me up. Um, but, you know, if I'm like, okay, well, I'm on deadline, today is the day this has to get done. What I'll do is look around for some inspiration, read a couple of other articles on the same topic, try to get my brain going. Um, but if that's not working, you know, walking away is the best thing I can do. Going and editing video or going and doing something not yeah. related to writing is usually pretty helpful. But I also think writing is a muscle. And the more I write and the more I do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. And when I have big projects along with the littler projects to work on, it seems to be easier. Like I'll try to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday for ghostwriting book stuff. And then Tuesday, Thursday, I'll work on blogs for myself, blogs right. for other clients, the shorter things. And so having a variety of things going on is also helpful because I can always switch over to something else if one thing isn't happening. 100%. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the industry then, because it seems like every man and their dog is a copywriter at the moment. Yeah. Uh, copywriting, <laughs> copywriting is a very popular niche mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be working on from pretty much any industry, I think. There's copywriters yeah. for everything. Yeah. How, how are you making sure that obviously your services are slightly different in terms of the ghostwriting side of things, but how do you make sure that you're you're heard, but also that people understand, like we said earlier, the differences between a copywriter, content writer, and, and a ghostwriter. Yes. Um, yeah, so everybody needs content, which is one good reason why it's good. There are a lot of copywriters out yeah. there. <laughs> um, and that's what I've found since I've been doing this, is just that um, there's so much of a need. There's a huge need for this stuff out there. Um, so I think for me, it comes down to finding clients who are a really good fit for me. Um, it's more, it's, people always ask me like, what industries do you write for? But it's, it really doesn't have a lot to do with industry for me. It's 
do you have ideas? Can you and I work together because we have a similar work ethic or mm -hmm. you're going to, you know, you're not going to hound me on the day that the thing is due, like asking me, is it still coming? You know, don't, don't yeah. do that. I told you it will come. <laughs> yeah, it will come. <laughs> that annoys me. Right. Um, so for, you know, when I, I think that when you find the type of clients that you're looking for in this industry, especially, um, it, it really flows really well. Like I know somebody who's specifically a copywriter for law firms mm -hmm. and that's a great niche. So I think finding the niche is really important, yeah. whether it's industry or just knowing what kind of clients you love to work with um, and going sorry. after those people. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, if we flip that around then, mm -hmm. and what would you say if, from a client's perspective, they need to be looking for mm. when when they are looking to hire a copywriter, a, a ghostwriter, a content writer, whatever, sort of that content side of things. Yeah, I think knowing what your copywriter can do for you is really important. I think a lot of people come to someone like me and think, oh, good, I'm done. I don't have to ever worry about my content <laughs> again. <laughs> they just think, you're right. hired now. Yeah, you're just yeah. going to send me all the right. content I need. Yes, but, you know, it works the best when you can give me an outline of what you want your blog to be. And a lot of clients, you know, sometimes they just roll their eyes like, oh, I thought that I didn't have to worry about this. You're just going to write two blogs for me every month. <laughs> um and I've done it that way, but it's so it comes better. It comes across as yours yeah. when you give me the angle, or you give me the bullet points. You know, and also if every client did that for you, you would be exhausted, yeah. and your quality of work would could greatly decrease. Exactly. I always tell them, you know, anyone can write uh, an article on this topic by googling it. You know, <laughs> the question is, what is your unique take on this thing? So I think for clients, knowing that is is huge and really important to help their writers out, their copywriters. Um, even with your brand, having an idea of, you know, how you want to come across. I'm edgy. I'm, you know, I'm yeah. really very professional and straight laced. I just want to strip straight up brand, mm -hmm. you know, um, that kind of thing. So like your uh, friend who writes for the law firm is if they were a young marketing agency it would be a completely different style of copy yes exactly yeah and that might not be the style that you're you know the reputation that you want so yeah. it's important to think about that and we've mentioned that obviously it's, it's quite a busy marketplace how do we as clients make sure that we're working with writers that one understand what needs to be done but also the quality of their because Mm -hmm. You know, not to be rude, but I'm guessing a lot of writers out there are com are competing with the that thought of going, oh, I can just rock up on Fiverr mm -hmm. and find or Upwork or right. whatever whatever next one there is, people are out and find someone for like you know five dollars. Which let's face it, we both know that that's not usually the best route to go down. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for just volume of content because you have a brand new website and you're trying to put out 50 blogs in the next 50 days or so, yeah. <laughs> something like that, it can it can make some sense. But that's true. I think the best way to make sure you get the quality that you're looking for is to read some stuff that person's written. Ask for writing mm -hmm. samples. I'm always shocked when clients hire me without looking at my writing at all. <laughs> I'm like, you're taking pretty big risks. Or is that a real honor? Is that, is that like <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you can you can learn a lot talking to somebody too. And I think that happens with me that you ask questions and you get great answers. Yeah. You know, you can trust that person. Um, and I think that happens a lot with my clients. Um, but, you know, you want to know what the writing is going to be like. But I always also say, well, look, my goal is to write in your voice. My goal mm -hmm. as a ghostwriter is to make sure it's unique to you. So here's some samples, but know that <laughs> this person's business is not your business. And yeah. so what you're looking for may sound different. But, yeah, I think that and talking with other people who have great content that you notice on social media or on their websites and say hey who's your writer you know did you write this yourself <laughs> um, i like how it is now almost assumed that if it's really good content it's written by a writer not by the business or the right individual. yeah 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 which is a weird yeah. world we live in now I yeah think. it is it's it's really interesting that you know even for myself marketing is a full-time job i mean yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah.
So. It really is. For you then, what's next? What's next for Pocket PhD? We, I mean, we touched upon about the how you're not sure about growing, or, you know, mm. hiring people, but for the next sort of six to 12 months, what sort of exciting projects do you have on the cards? Yeah, so I mentioned the physical therapy book I'm starting this week. Uh, I've been in talks with someone else out in California to write a book um, kind of on his his business journey and his, his business origin story. So that might start up. Um, I've also been thinking about some um, online courses. So I have an online course for DIYing your business book. It's called Business Book 90. Um, but that's a huge course. It take, it's, takes you from zero to book in 90 days. Wow. And yeah, so I've been thinking about breaking that course down and, and offering sort of mini courses um, mm -hmm. on each of the modules um, aligned with that course. So that's sort of my next launch plan, <laughs> I would say, is to, to write, create some smaller online course offerings. Yeah, it's definitely something that I think people are, are desiring, isn't it? You know, the mm -hmm. smaller courses, the... I, I think I've seen probably about 3,000 five-day challenges this year already. Yeah. <laughs> um, people right. are, are wanting those short mm – -hmm. I'm not sure if they design the quick results or they want the short taster because it's also – Yeah. Obviously yeah. Not Right. Yeah. I've been thinking about also, I really love teaching and, and I think there's a hunger also for interactive courses, yeah, interactive definitely. workshops, not just sit there and, and absorb material, but yeah. be in a group and adding that human element to it, yeah, that group yeah. element. Uh, like, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're part of a mastermind. I run a mastermind. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things is, is actually the fact that people can talk to each other that are in a similar position and understand right. and, and just get the the problems that are going on the solutions that are going on that is super yeah. undervalued um in any business not yeah. just online businesses absolutely yeah and especially during lockdown and everything people are just craving more interaction with people yeah. and they have the time to do it um so yeah. yeah it is really good listen emily uh one of my final questions for you is if if someone was going to hire a copyright like we touched on a part about before but what would be the sort of two or three things that are must-haves from that copywriter ghostwriter content writer before that person should hire them um must-haves um i would say enough writing samples that you feel comfortable that this person can do the job has the experience to to write the thing for you um, I think having the time also to focus enough on the content to make sure that that writer can, you can convey the, what you want that writer to write for you um, yeah. in well enough that you have the thought space, the mental space enough to tell them what to write. They're saving you a lot of time doing the writing, exactly. but, but you need to be able to brainstorm with them a bit. Um, and a really clear idea of you know, where your business is headed and what, what you want your your brand to say to your audience, who your audience is, all these kinds of sort of, I would say, foundational questions that you need yeah. to know for your own business. Make sure it's amazing that how many people don't there. know that. Yeah, I know, I know. And it, it's really difficult in the beginning. People tell you when you start your business, you need to figure out who your ideal client is. Yeah, yeah you need to clarify, you know, what you're offering. It's, it's tough. It takes time and, you know, I would say don't don't try to rush it if you're brand new. You know, think about mm -hmm. think about all of these things and let it happen organically. But, yeah, hundred you know, percent. Yeah. It'll get there. You'll get there. I think but, people yeah. focus on with the with the ideal client. On my last point here, I think people focus on having that ideal client for the next five years, and actually, yeah. it could be the next three months, six months. It's got to be <laughs> exactly. relevant. What you do now yeah. doesn't have to be forever. Um, yeah, that's right. Great. Mm -hmm. my final question is then how can people find out more about you how can people find out more about the pocket phd great so my website is thepocketphd.com happy to to find everything there i'm also on linkedin quite a lot emily crookston i'm on twitter i have a facebook page the pocket phd is on facebook and a new instagram page so yeah. <laughs> fantastic <laughs> emily thank you so much for coming on to speak more about ghostwriting and your journey it's been fascinating and i do really look forward to watching the pocket phd grow and see where you end up i appreciate it Stephen. thanks so much thank you and thanks everyone for listening and watching the spin founders 365